All right, and this is the Fulati Fitness Podcast, episode number nine, joined today by my guy, Josiah, a.k.a. Guru G. Brahman, a man with a lot of knowledge and wisdom when it comes to topics like spirituality, self-realization, and non-duality. So I appreciate you joining the podcast, man, and I'm ready to run it up. Thank you for having me, brother. I'm glad to be with another former God. No doubt, man, no doubt. So starting off this podcast, I kind of wanted to ask you, what was your life like before the spiritual path? And what essentially were the events that got you on the journey we see you on today? So before my, wow, before the sages is a, is a dark time. There was no light for sure. I mean, there's glimpses of light, but the sages, they let you know that there's something there that has infinite light. And that's the beauty of the sages. And before I was so depressed, I was like, I, I went through a lot growing up as a kid mentally. And I was always in chaos in a sense that I'd be from here, this place to that place everywhere everything's perfect and everything changes everything's going well now everything's taken away from you and it's like i just i was so depressed so it's like so you know to the point of almost like suicide in the sense that i just did not want to be in this world i was so tired of this world but the, what's the funny part is is that the sages let you know that's actually a good thing because as sage siddhar meswar said one who is disgusted with the illusion is actually advanced in spirituality because a man who is tired of his toxic wife or a woman who's tired of her toxic husband, she's more likely to leave somebody who's still in that honeymoon phase and they're love bombing and not really showing. And they're like, oh, I love the love bombing, but they don't pay attention to the toxic parts. But somebody who's like, I mean, I can't stand this. They're more likely to leave an abusive relationship. And that's the abusive relationship Maya tries to put you in. And that's the abusive relationship I was in is that I would expect happiness from this existence. Then I would then when I would get it, then I'd be so attached to the concept of, oh, I'm a character who has this pleasure and it belongs to me. But then the sages, they killed my ego to the point that this spirituality, it is true spirituality in a sense that it is beyond an idea of being anything, in a sense that it's beyond being limited. So before the sages, I was limited. After the sages, I was limitless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to put it, limited to limitless. But, uh, was there any specific events or was there any specific like uh, scenarios that was the tipping point that really got you focused on the spiritual path? You started, yeah. So actually, as somebody who had interviewed before and it, it's, it shows you the results. I'm, I'm, I'm the results of, of his hard work and it shows you the power of the spirituality is Guru Madhu Sudana is that the only time I found true spirituality, you know, everybody, all these other teachers, you know, they... They give you kind of knowledge and stuff like that, but they don't get they don't give the respect to the ancient traditions like you do, like Madhu Sudana does. And when I was a 16 year old, you know, come, first come, actually 15, first coming across Madhu Sudana's page, you know, it was like wow, like this is like like I just remember like being in my room listening to him saying like you're not the mind and just like actually practicing and like sitting and just like watching my mind and like. I don't, I can't put it into words, but that was like my first experience of Samhati. It's like when I was listening to Guru Madhu, Madhu Sudan and he was just explaining that like, you're not your mind. Mm -hmm. And in a video, this was, this was like, this one back in the, when he used to do like the porch videos and it's in the back, in his backyard. So I like, I just, I just remember like this, like this, like, oh my God, like I'm not the mind. Like, oh my God. Like it was like a first glimpse. And then I kept like, ever since then, I was chasing that, like, glimpse of, like, being beyond, you know, making it permanent. Because I was upset. I wanted to, like, make existence my bitch, in a sense. Like, I wanted to be, make it impossible for me to suffer. Like, and that, and <laughs> when you, when you want that, you find the sages. And I wanted to be, like, if I lost everything, like, let's say I was a billionaire and I lost everything, I'd still be, like, blissful. That's ever since I was a teenager, I wanted, and I used to have a lot of heartbreak and the sages, they're the biggest, like, oh, no, like, be detached from women. Like, they, and it's just beautiful, like, how the sages, like, this world is constantly trying to force you. Like, Sage Tibbet Harmeswar said, the, the parent is constantly trying to bring us into worldly life, get married, do this and that. Everything that we do is to get married, to be able to pay for our, our wives' our wives bills. <laughs> but it's like, you realize that the guru is the true father, the true parent, the true mother who's trying to lead you to freedom. Mm-hmm. That's a beautiful way to say it, man. So you were getting into uh, Madhu Sanada's uh, content and stuff like that. And did that lead you to more of the uh, Vedic texts and the Vedic ancient wisdom? 
And what really caught your eye of that that philosophy? Yes, he was the first domino, and it was, so another so another guru I found because of Madhusudana is because you know he's very uh, generous with his wisdom. So, but you can find a bunch of gurus through him. Is Sage Siddhar Meshwar Maharaj, and oh my God, I love Sage Siddhar Meshwar Maharaj. I mean, just like Sage Madhusudana, he breaks boundaries in a sense that. He goes beyond what you think an, a sage should be in the sense that there's so many ideas of religious ideals of, oh, you should be this way, you should be that way. But it's funny that Sage Siddhar Meshwar, who's a saint, his, his statue, his altar has a, as a, cigar, as a uh, cigar blunt. It was, it was, so it's like, it shows you that when you become God, when you become enlightened, like you can, you're, you're holy no matter what you do. And it's beautiful. Like, and, and he, Manishadana's work is what also led me to more beautiful works like Nesagadarta Maharaj and Osho is a great one. Ananda Mayima, you know, Ama. There's so many different sages that are just incredible. And it's like, the Astravata Gita is also Manishadana showed me that one too. And also, there's just so many, there's so many great texts, like a bunch of Osho's books and a bunch of, uh, what's it called? Like Siddhar Meshwar has a bunch of like master of self realization. I could go on all day. I get yeah. I, I probably answered your question. I could like because I could go no, on all perfect. day. About, like, that's perfect. That's perfect. That's what we're doing this podcast for. So, um, going off that, I would ask you right now as a person who understands these concepts, but in a in a way where pretend I'm someone who doesn't understand the the ideas of self realization of non duality. How would you explain it to them? in a practical sense, so the modern man or the modern person who's watching this can actually realize and understand what it means to be self-realized or to be in a state of non-duality or, like you said, be quote-unquote God or enlightened. Like, how would you conceptualize that in a way where it's easy to grasp? Because there's a lot of these texts, there's a lot of these pieces of ancient wisdom that myself and yourself, Madhu Sudana, uh, all go into, and it's pretty dense and deep but we're trying to take it in a way where we can repackage it for the modern man and for the modern world to understand it but how would be how would it be in your words packaged in a way where everyone can understand that this is this is a great question so i'll tell a story there was a story of a lion who was fooled into thinking he was a mouse and he used to scavenge for cheese he could have been hunting buffalo and having infinite splendor, he could have had an entire pack, he could have had infinite pleasure. And also knowing that he's the lion. It's not that the pleasure makes him the lion, it's that he's always the lion. But he was fooled into thinking he was even less than somebody who's a lion that needs pleasure. He thought he was a mouse. And then one day, this lion stumbles upon a sage. And the sage tells him, no, you're not a mouse. He gets a mirror and shows him, you are the lion. Mm. Ever since then, the lion has seen the mirror. He's had glimpses of, the, of being a lion, but still he cannot believe it. So the sage tells him continuously, he shows him in the mirror, you are the lion, you are the lion, because Maya has gaslighted the lion. He, she has tricked him into thinking that he's a mouse, but the sage is constantly reminding that you're the lion, you're the lion, you're free, you're the king of kings, because you are beyond any material fleeting uh, ex existence that is not, t is, that is not, that does not last forever. Because self-realization is the realization that anything you do is holy. Everything that you do is God's actions. It's not, oh, I do this and that, so I'm holy. I do this and that, so I'm free. No, you're always free. You're always the lion. A lion can't become a cheetah. That's impossible. It can only remain the lion. And you fool yourself into thinking you're the mind when the mind is temporary. And there's a whole different, there's a bunch of different animals in animal kingdom, but they're all still an animal. And that's what you are. You're, in a sense, God. But... So because God is bored, because God loves to express himself and have union with himself and destroy, create and destroy himself, he's created this Maya to find himself, in a sense. So when you're thinking about self-realization, re always remember that it's God finding himself. It's not somebody who's not God finding himself. A lot of people get caught up in, I have to become God. No, you are already God. Because a lot of people think, okay, if I gain this spiritual power, that means I'm God now. If I can predict the future, that means I'm God now. No, just being as you are is already God. Being is God, not thinking about God. That's, that's a really...
powerful um, way to put it. Being is God. And like a lot of people in the day-to-day lives don't understand the concept of just being. And that's why you have to do things like meditation, pranayama, stuff like that to get you back into that state of mind because there's so much external stimulus, so much distractions and temptations trying to pull your attention away from that inward knowledge or gnosis that uh, it kind of pulls you into further into the matrix of the Maya. And how would you kind of guide someone out of that? What would, what would be the first steps you would take or first pieces of advice you would give to someone who's seeking the spiritual path and is looking to essentially break out of the matrix or break out of the Maya and just peer through the illusion? I would tell them to devote themselves to the sages because a lot of people, these, the Western, the very foolish people, they say, I don't need a guru. I don't need a teacher. But actually those people are people who they take people's knowledge and then give them no credit. And then they say, oh, I don't need a teacher. But everybody has had a teacher. Your mom teaches you things. Everybody teaches you something. Life is the guru. But also people, they learn from a specific teacher. Like I was talking to this girl. And she was talking about Kundalini. And I asked her, okay, where did you learn Kundalini from? She said, on the internet. So I said, well, there had to be an author on the internet for you to find out about Kundalini. She didn't remember that person. And then people, they'll wonder why they aren't enlightened yet. Because they take, they treat spirituality like fast food. They don't, they don't take it seriously. They don't devote themselves to it. Somebody devotes themselves to a healthy lifestyle. but they, de- they And then they'll say, oh... Oh, I don't want to be, devo- why should I be devoted to the guru? Well, you're devoted to somebody at all times, either your mother, your, your husband, your wife, this, that, and it all ends up in disappointment and sadness. It's never, even your, if you have the greatest wife, you can, ha- she can die. But the thing is the guru, when you devote yourself to the guru, you put the guru before all, then you realize that the guru, it goes beyond all because he's only telling you that everything else is temporary. He's not saying to be attached to him. He's saying, he's actually constantly reminding you that he'll die. So you can, you really can't get attached to him. It's impossible. It's impossible. The, the guru will send you away if you're getting attached to him. So mm-hmm. devote yourself to the sages because they are a constant reminder of wisdom. It's a constant sharpening of your wisdom sword. And a lot of people, the people, you'll notice that Sri Krishna, Sage Krishna, he had a guru, Sandi Pandi. And you'll notice all the people who are recognized as a sage, they had a guru. Even Osho, he didn't have a direct guru, but he had a bunch of gurus that he used to give as examples to teach. So in the sense that there's a bunch, you always have teachers in your life. And it's like when you're aware of those teachers, then you can, you constantly use them as a way to constantly sharpen your wisdom sword. Even Jesus, Jesus had snuck away from Mary and Mary found him in the temple listening to wisdom teachers. That's a verse in the Bible. But then the Western people, they, oh, I don't need a guru. No, you want to take people's knowledge and feel like a prophet, feel like a genius, feel like, oh, I didn't need any help. Everybody has help. We're literally all one. Everybody, the, the village helps the village. It's not the individual carries the village. Even the greatest king, if the guys, people aren't farming, there is no king. That's good. That's good uh, way to put it that. You always need some source of knowledge, some source of information, wisdom to guide you throughout this um, existence. And a lot of the wisdom and knowledge that you gain from these ancient texts, that you gain from all this spiritual knowledge, is are basically tools to help you uncover your own inner wisdom that's always been there, that's always that that's always will be there, but it's just covered up by so many distractions and so many attachments. So what would be some certain practices or certain uh, techniques that you've used to help cut through all that nonsense, to help cut through the illusions of attachments to identities, to egos, to personalities, all that stuff? Self-inquiry is the greatest because it's the most direct method. All this pranayama, breathing and stuff like that, it, it makes you focus on one point. But self-inquiry makes you beyond even the need for focus because it goes beyond the mind. It's, it's directly to the point. For example, like some people might use mantras to kind of remember the divine. But with self-inquiry, you remember the divine self-evidently in the sense that it's like having your wife physically there instead of having a long distance relationship. It's like you get the love the same way, but it's just better to have 
her directly right there. In a sense that it's better, it's best to directly go beyond the mind because you get direct experience. You and you get and with mantras you can get direct experience, but self inquiry is just the fastest way. And basically, it's exposing the mind. It's showing it for the liar that it is. For example, if your mind tries to make you suffer, you just ask, "To whom do these thoughts come?" And it's, it brings you straight back to the source because you're so used to saying, "I am thinking this and that," but then it's, you ask, "Wait, wait a minute. To whom do these thoughts come?" Then you can't give yourself an answer because you realize you're not any. It's not coming to anybody in particular because these thoughts come all around and around, but it's not going anywhere. It's it's just being used by existence for me to carry out an action. It's just inspiration. It's not. It's not. It doesn't belong to me. It's just exist. It's a tool of existence to to function and have fun. Yeah, I, I'm not doing anything. So that's facts. Yeah, it's uh, those thoughts aren't your own most of the time, or ninety nine percent of the time. It's just these flows of uh, external stimulus that are like conforming into a way where it tracks into your mind. But a lot of people think that whatever thoughts they have in their mind, they have to act upon it. They ha it's like an impulse. It's like a reaction. They don't realize that they can detach from that. So how would you um, tell someone that there is that little point in between thoughts or point in between actions and reactions that you can sit in silence and sit in that state of self-inquiry that keeps you detached from just acting upon every emotion you have or acting upon each uh, action that's happened in your life i would tell them to pay attention to their pure sense of existence their pure being don't pay attention to the mind pay attention to that brahmin state that pure being that's be that's alive but is beyond any concept of being alive such as i'm a boy i'm a man no it's just pure being sage nisagadarta was asked would you teach a murderer he said i see no saints or sinners i only see living beings so that when you pay attention to that pure being you get beyond i am a happy person i am a sad person just pay attention to that pure sense of existence that just that pure being and don't think, wait, what's what's pure being? What's pure sense of existence? Well, you know that you exist, right? You you not that you exist, this idea of you, but you know that your beingness is there. You know that for sure. But but as a baby, you didn't think about your existence. You just were. And this is why they say the the Buddha's mind is like a baby's because you realize that a baby is God in a sense that God doesn't think about anything. He is everything. Thoughts are in God. God is not in thoughts. So that's why people get caught up. They try to find God, but you know God is just is as it is. You don't need to do anything about thoughts. Thoughts are also a part of God, so you can use thoughts when you realize that you're beyond them. But it's like people get caught up in the the fallacy of thinking, "No, I'm my mind. No, you're pure being. You're not your mind. God uses thoughts. He is not thought." So when people just pay attention to their pure being, their pure existence, which is God, then they'll realize like. I'm not my thoughts, I'm my pure being, and I'm even beyond the pure being, because even my sense of being doesn't last in deep sleep. So God is beyond even a sense of being, but your sense of being is the closest thing you'll have to God. But it's not, it does, even that doesn't last. But paying attention to that I am, that pure I am, is better than paying attention to the mind, because the mind is temporary, while your pure sense of being, even though it also is temporary, it's a lot less, it doesn't try to give you BS. Your pure being doesn't try to give you BS. That's why... Your pure being is enough. That's why a sage can be happy while being completely poor, while a king can be w w completely lost in himself in the sense that he's just so depressed because he is not beyond his mind, while a sage is beyond his mind. He's happy with just his pure existence. So it's about just getting in touch with that pure existence. I keep emphasizing pure being because it's very important. It's literally the doorway to, to, to the absolute. It's literally. Like, I can't stress how important enough your pure being is. Mm -hmm. And how would you explain to someone that hasn't reached that state or hasn't really felt it how would you explain the uh, concept of pure being of pure existence of that samadhi state that's say siddhar meswar said one who talks about brahman has never been to that town in a sense that if i was trying to explain to you what pure being is what enlightenment is what it feels like what it sounds like i'd be a liar because it's mm. beyond sound it's beyond feeling this is the beauty of God is that he is limitless. And this is why people, the, this is why the ego is so scared of being God. It's because it's a fool. It thinks experience belongs to it, but experience belongs to God. So when you go beyond experience, you realize that all experience goes into God. So you just, you don't hold on to experience. You just let it flow through you. There's no need to hold on because it, nothing, none of it belongs to you.
It just is. So it's like trying to find God or trying to even to say, okay, Samhadi is like this. That's an experience of enlightenment, but enlightenment is beyond experience. So don't try to think about enlightenment, be enlightenment, but Mm -hmm. you can't think about it. Let the silence speak for itself. You can't try to find it with the mind. It won't, the mind brought you into bondage. It will never bring you out of bondage. It's like a toxic ex. You just need to need to leave it alone to make it go away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Perfectly said, perfectly said. Now, um, I would like to ask you also, like when you were going through this spiritual journey and this uh, whole path that we see you on today, was it like a fight between your ego and this new wisdom that you were going through? And a lot of people also might relate to that. Like, how did you um, essentially deal with that? How did you go about that whole shift in perspective where you're detaching from all the previous egos, identities, and this overall concept that I am this, I am that, into this more universal perspective that uh, understanding that you are all. So there's a stage where you're at where it's like, you, you kind of know intellectually, but it's not your direct experience, which is why you still get caught up in mind attacks. Enlightenment is you just, you never get caught up in a mind attack because the idea of a mind is so laughable to you. It's so, you're so detached from the mind that the idea that it could make you suffer is is literally like it's like somebody walking up to you and telling you you're a girl when you're a boy it's like what are you what the hell are you saying i can't suffer that's that's it how enlightenment is so it's like when you when you get caught up in mind attacks in a sense it's you fooling yourself into thinking that you're limited or that you ever had a problem in the first place so you kind of just let the mind be in a sense that you don't try to you don't try to quiet it. You just let it be quiet. And when that quietness happens, is it uh, a way for you to just be able to be still in that enlightenment phase? Or is it like one step to the next uh, phase of the spiritual development journey? You you don't even like there's no like there's not even a next step. Like people are going to mm-hmm. be annoyed with me because I'm not. I'm not going to give you any more words to try to fill your brain up, to try to understand. You know, there's nothing to understand. There's nothing to try to understand. There's nothing to seek. There's nothing to search for. There, it, it just is. Don't even try to like, oh, okay, I'm this character in this stage of enlightenment trying to get past this stage or that stage. Like, no, like you are already enlightened. Like Sage Siddhar Meshwar said beautifully, he said, in the beginning, Sage Krishna was thinking of himself as a god. And you know what happened in the end? He wasn't even thinking of himself as a god. Because when you are something, you don't even think about it. You just are. So mm. you have to know that you're enlightened. You don't have to think, okay, I'm, I'm trying to search for enlightenment. Let me, let me try to search. No, that's your home is right here and now. It's, it's always here and now. But you, keep, you, you create this identity that has a problem and then has to solve it. You never had anything. Trust me. I'm telling you, not even God has power. Because when everything is you, you don't have any power. You're bored as hell. You don't have any power. You're just constantly doing shit. You're not, you don't, there's nothing to, it's your own vacuum that you're just, like imagine you were in your house, like house just playing with a toy forever. But you're not conscious that you're playing. You're just playing like with the toy mm-hmm. forever. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And uh, for the people that are hearing this and like, okay, like I'm, I already am enlightened. I already am uh, in that pure state of existence. How would you explain to them that this pure state of existence it has always been there, yet there's a lot of blockages from psychological turmoil, psychological uh, attachments that you, they need to cut through that is kind of, it might sound pleasurable to them right now, like, oh, I have this amount of money, oh, I have this amount of uh, material possessions, I'm this person, I'm at this status, and it might sound all great to them right now. And then you're going to come in and basically say that you need to not give them up, but detach from them to actually get into the pure state of existence and fulfillment that your soul really desires for. So I would tell them, be careful with that psychological perspective because you, that's the, the I am is very important. Don't you dare say I am that. Stick with the I am because people will try to put a that after the I am. But mm-hmm. people listening to this, don't don't you dare do this to yourself. Don't limit yourself. Because even when you say, like some scars is good, but 
it's like you're too frantically worried in a sense that the person who's calmly analyzing, okay, he's, he's a night guard, right? And he's calmly analyzing, just watching to see, like, okay, who, like, you know, just calmly looking, like, and now it's like a set pattern where it's like, okay, now I'm looking back and forth and it's calm and it's just, it's smooth. But now the person who's, oh my God, what's going to happen? Where, like, you know, where, where's this and that? So in a sense, don't try to do anything. Don't try to fix yourself. Don't try to be this and that. Trust your being, trust your natural intelligence, your divine intelligence, that you will be aware of the samskara and you'll be able to turn your mind away in a sense that you'll send it away in a sense that your mind will try to tell you things like oh i'm neg i'm depressed because this is why people they they fall in love with their pain is because they're so used to it but when you go beyond the idea of even i am a person who has had these psychological issues and i have to overcome them you just stick with the i am your i am has no problems it doesn't even have a problem to solve so you never had a problem in the first place. A lot of people think enlightenment is about improvement. But there's so many critiques of sages. And there's so many sages that their behavior, if they were in the West, they would have been called insane. But mm -hmm. they, were, like, they were spiritual geniuses who had different ways about going about teachings in the sense that people wouldn't understand different ways people go about things and the, the, the sages go about things because they have their ideas of what you should be, what is psychologically proper. What is mentally healthy? As long as you're blissful, worry about that. Don't worry about being what you view as a positive person or a perfect person. Worry about being blissful and every and all that other stuff will take care of itself. But because mm -hmm. you're so focused on improving this mind that you think belongs to you, then you can't have peace because you're so focused on improving a character that is constantly shifting between ideas of itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, with this knowledge and wisdom when it comes to spirituality, a lot of people might think that what's the point of trying to get into these type of topics or trying to actually understand these deeper concepts and overall philosophies that's going to help free me. So what would you say to them that like, where's the biggest impact on your life, being able to go on this journey, be able to go on this path and how is it essentially enhance your human experience for the time being? Because a lot of people, again, are going to be like, all right, this guy's saying a lot of cool words and like a lot of cool concepts and like similes and metaphors, but like, how is this going to help me in my life? A lot of people don't realize that there's different aspects to quote unquote self-improvement of like, okay, you have to master the mind, master the body, but there's a missing element to it, which is the spiritual side that a lot of people kind of overlook and be like, ah, it's just for like hippies or like just for people that are uh, religious and stuff like that. But what would you say from someone who is, actually deeply into this path and understands the profound uh, impact it has. I'll tell them a story of there was a devotee of Krishna and a lot of people, he was a devotee of Guru Krishna, but because he was a rich man, he used to have a bunch of rich clothes. And a lot of people thought he was superficial. They didn't think he was spiritual because like you said, people think it's all this, it's just only for hippies or whatever, but it's a lot more profound than this, but than that hippies, right? So it's funny that people thought that person was just some superficial rich person. But then this this saint actually knew. He knew it because saints can see into people's minds with certain cities. And basically he knew that the person was thinking about Krishna all the time, like that rich person. But because he had the outward appearance of being rich, people thought he was just some superficial rich person. So in a sense, you can think about spirituality while still partaking in your, I know people want their super, their material items. And trust me, no, the sages don't want to take that away from you. And what's beautiful is that you'll actually be able to move better in the material world because isn't it better to shoot an arrow calmly than frantically? And so why would you not want peace? Like some fool will ask me, well, why does bliss matter? Why does breathing matter? Everybody is chasing bliss, but they don't realize it. When you're with a lover, you're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about the I, you're thinking about the other person. Everybody wants to be beyond an idea of self because that's the natural flow, that's the Tao. When you're thinking about go going home after work and you just sit in your bed, that's bliss. Bliss is in this everywhere. But you see, and I'm not one of those people, those hypocrites, those liars, because I'm not a sal salesman. I don't say, oh, I'm going to enlighten the entire world. No, it's going to be a cycle <laughs> where... This amount of people get enlightened, these amount of people don't get enlightened, and then the same, and then this, 
uh, 200 years ago, somebody like me will be saying the same shit in a different way. So, because the truth is consistent. So, basically, it's like, I don't, you don't worry about people who understanding you, oh, a lot of people, they're scared of spirituality because they're like, what are other people going to think? This knowledge of enlightenment is not for everybody. Because there's been a bunch of, it is for, it's available to everybody, but it's not going to be won by everybody. It's just like yeah. a lottery ticket. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. And it's, it's, it's because, available, yeah. but not everyone's going to want that. Yeah, that's perfectly said, yeah. And it's like, and it, it's like people, they're so devoted to materialism and they don't realize that that's their religion. And nobody's telling you to co-sign to a religion. We're just telling you to be devoted to bliss, your own freedom. That's it. That's all the gurus are saying. But people don't, they don't want to be devoted to freedom and bliss because that pain, that pleasure and that pain, because I'm telling you, you ask, how would it help your material life? You actually get more pleasure, but there'll be no pain. But you actually like that pain because it makes the pleasure better because it's the relief of the pain that makes the pleasure. That's why your mm -hmm. ego doesn't want to, wants to run away. But I'm telling you, you'll experience pleasure way better because you'll be so detached from it. You won't even care. It's like, you'll just be so blissful and you, you'll be free that it just comes to you and you won't even care about it. Like, say said Hermeswar said, lost me as a slave to the one who does not care for her, the goddess of fortune, and makes the beggar of the one who runs after her. So you'll just see that your material life will become a lot better, but you won't even care about it because you'll realize that that divine pleasure, that divine bliss that is infinite is a whole lot better than any pleasure this world can give you. So people who they want to, they're focused on, on improving their material life before they're focused on bliss. Don't, don't come to me. You can't, we can't, you, there's no, you can't learn from me. There's no, sorry. There's, if you, if you're devoted more to gaining something than shedding that ego, then we can't, there's nothing you're in spirit. True spirituality is not for you. I'm sorry. It is for you, but you're thinking it's not for you because you're holding yourself back. But it's for everybody because you're constantly in that true spiritual enlightened state. So it can't be just for the, the poor man. It can't just be for the rich man. So don't think spirituality is going to take away from your material life because you are always in that blissful state no matter where you are. Like in the Ashravata Gita, it says sometimes the sage, he's, he's a prince among spoils. And then sometimes he retires to his mountain cave. So you can do whatever you want. Yeah, a lot of people think that Especially when it comes to the whole like new age spirituality movement where they're kind of like butchering a lot of the ancient uh, wisdom and ancient actual teachings of freedom of self-realization. They think that, okay, being spiritual means buying all these different types of like knickknacks that make you look like you're spiritual by going to a yoga class, by posting on Instagram that uh, I did this breath work for this amount of time and doing this stuff like that when in reality... Um, that's like a form of traditional knowledge where you accumulate and you gain more wisdom through different types of outlets when true spirituality in essence is the knowledge is gained through removing uh, different things. You're not trying to read more books or read more uh, texts. Yes, you can read more books and read more texts, but those texts aren't giving you more information. They're actually removing a lot of different uh, blockages and removing a lot of different attachments to help you get back into that wisdom that was always there and that's always going to be there. But like you said, a lot of people will overlook that and not like realize that you kind of have to flip, flip the script and look at it oppositely or inversely because the spiritual realm and the material realm are, they're mirrors of each other. But if you look into a mirror, they're, they're flipped. The, the, the reflections are flipped. So you kind of do the opposite when it comes to your spiritual growth rather than you would in your business or your your gym or your um overall self-improvement journey so another thing i really liked how you pointed out was that a lot of people are scared of quote unquote the blissful pleasure because they're attached to pain so how would you break that down further in depth and in detail for people to actually realize that oh man i'm actually a drug addict or a junkie when it comes to my pain like i always go back to it like a uh how a dog vomits and it goes right back to the vomit start eating it they don't realize that they're doing that on a day-to-day -day basis so it's almost like you ever and this is gonna be a nasty example but when some you're on the toilet and you're like constipated right and you just finally <laughs> get that relief of of and it's like that relief that you get after finally getting that constipated you know uh number two out it, it just gives you that like Oh, but let's say the constipation never happened. Then you wouldn't have the relief. You just would be, you see. So it's like without the, the relief, without the pain, there's no relief. So this ego, it has, and then now, right? 
now, okay, look, for example, right? Now, when because of the pain of the constipation and the relief, now you're a person who can say, I'm a person who was on the toilet, and now I'm a person who's also relieved from it. But without the action of being with the problem on the toilet and the relief, what are you? Nothing. Without pleasure and pain, you're nothing. Because to hug your brother and your sister, that's pleasure. To love your mom and everybody is pleasure. But you know what's true happiness? There's no reason for it. Pleasure, and people won't like this. They think, oh, even, even to go with people who like to go to church, to, to a Christian church, they take pleasure in taking group activities. They take pleasure in feeling like they're morally superior. But the, the sage, he takes pleasure in nothing. That's why he can take pleasure in everything. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a contradiction, but because the reason he takes pleasure in nothing is that he doesn't allow anything to pleasure him because he's always free from pleasure. He's the limitless God. He can't be pleasured. Mm -hmm. He is pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, it's a paradox. It's, it's inverse of what we think. Like we think that we know certain things, yet on the spiritual uh, side of things, it's the exact opposite. Like um, to, to get to that state of pleasure, it's not by chasing pleasure, it's just like by stopping and realizing the pleasures all within, like the true happiness, true joy and true bliss is within. Just how do you tap into it? You're so programmed to go do more, do more, do more, especially in the Western uh, society where more is always equated to better then you start to flip the script and realize that actually sometimes doing less on the spiritual side is going to get you to that state of existence that you were always in. But now you've been distracted. Your attention is pulling you this way, pulling you that way, pulling you that way. And um, when you start realizing that and putting it into practice, you'll start noticing that, okay, uh, Guruji Brahman is not insane. Fulati Fitness is not insane. Like all these people are not insane. Like, they, they start to realize that maybe I was insane the entire time or the entire time. Yeah. So how would you, if you're talking to your younger self, how would you kind of explain that? Like, yo, you might think I'm stupid right now, but in, in a couple of years, when you start to actualize all these teachings and these concepts, you're going to realize that your entire life before this, your 15, 16 years before this, you were sleepwalking. You were essentially zombie you were on autopilot mode letting society letting the matrix letting the maya control you now spiritual wisdom essentially allows you to get control back but not in a controlling type of manner where you're like okay i gotta grasp this grasp that it's freeing you and when you have freedom you have the most control ever like a lot of people don't realize that yes exactly and i so what i would do with my younger self is i would show him that freedom in a sense that i would just ask him just just you say you're depressed, you say you're sad, but I just want to ask you, do those feelings last? And if those feelings don't last, like if, 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 if the sadness lasts forever, if no other emotion comes, then, then may Kali strike me down now. But if, if they don't, if it doesn't last, then now you start to recognize the journey of the sages. Now it's too late because as Sage said, Harmeshwar says, even if a fool wants to leave this knowledge, once he has experience of it, it will never leave him. Because mm -hmm. how can it? You realize the mind is temporary. And a lot of people will think, oh, well, it, I, I feel so bad for people who don't believe in enlightenment. Like, that's so sad. Like, you, imagine if you can't not believe you can never be in a state where you never suffer. That's sad. But it's like, damn, like, how, like, how do you hold yourself back? I mean, that's literally what the ego does. But even they're really holding themselves back. Like, imagine somebody trying to tell you you're limit. Like, people, the skeptics, they'll be like, like, imagine somebody trying to tell you you're limitless and free and you're beyond your mind and you don't have to suffer. And you're talking about, oh, this guy's trying to, like, some people are, are, are skeptical of this age. Like, how are you skeptical of somebody who's trying to free you from your mind? And like you said, it's freedom. It's the greatest freedom in the world. Freedom from the mind. Because what are you but the mind? In deep sleep, you have no mind. Now you wake up and you use something you call the mind and you attach a you to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people will take all these informations like someone's actually trying to help them. And then that egotistical part of them, all the programming they've had, well, it just kind of autopilots them to react. They're like, nah, nah, man. Like that's, there's no way. Like that's bullshit. This is all nonsense. This is like all hippie talk and stuff like that. But another thing that you mentioned that I want to talk about is how, Essentially, when you're on the uh, spiritual path and when you're on the spiritual journey, um, you might not, or when you get to that point, you kind of, you can't go back. It's like taking the red pill in the movie, The Matrix, like 
you can take it but you can't go back you can't be in that state of like ignorance is bliss now you're in a state of like knowledge is power and freedom and wisdom is in that state where you can't unlearn those teachings once you've tasted it before a lot of people might seem that's like scary like i, I like my life i like my little comfort zone that i'm in why would i want to put myself in that position of getting to these higher states of consciousness even though in reality once i get to those points my life in totality will be enhanced but they're just stuck in their little comfort zone and they don't want to experience life to its fullest potential that's and that's the, that's the craziest part is it's not even them saying that it's that animal mind that's desperate for survival like you said it's like it doesn't want to, like it's like because the mind the humans love habit because it's guaranteed survival i mean that's why we built a home because it's a habit of survival i sleep here and i survive reoccurringly so that is my home mm -hmm. so people and that's the mind you think certain things right depression i am sad i am this and that and that's how the mind the mind thinks that the sadness is its home but it's actually having no home you're so used to having your limited home right you're with you're it's like it's like staying in your hometown that's been holding you back when you could travel the world mm -hmm. but you want to hold on to the ego slash your hometown when it's been holding mm -hmm. you back you want to hold on to this limited eye when you could be god and become anything this limited mm -hmm. eye you want to be when you can become god this is this is god he can have the hand and but he's open space around the hand but you want to be this conformed eye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, when people don't realize that and they kind of like shun or kind of like shy away from this type of information, they don't realize that even when they're doing that, it's not just for themselves, but it's also affects the other people around them. When you're operating at those higher states of consciousness, you're able to provide the most value to the world as a whole, not just for yourself. Enlightenment isn't just me, 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 oh, I'm going to be like free, this and that. But when you're free, you're able to help other people become free and you're not attached to certain things. So like if you get in certain situations where people are arguing, people are fighting, yet you're operating at a higher stage of consciousness, you can realize that all these people, it's the egos talking, and it's the attachments talking, not their true self. So I'm not going to take it personally. I'm not going to fight back. And there's so many different positives to this state of mind and this state of consciousness that people don't realize that will happen to them once they actually take that next step yes you, that's like such a great point because miracles start happening like you'll become the wise man like like sage ramana said a realized one he can't help but benefit the world like you said mm -hmm. a, you can't help but help people in this state because you'll literally like you won't even believe it because it's like your mind will be so used to just like this the old you, but then like you'll have also this new consciousness point where it'll be like aware of like holy shit, like I'm limitless, but I also can't think about how limitless I am. I'm so damn limitless. Mm -hmm. So it's like your body catches up to your mind, and then you start seeing because you're so humble. You don't even think like you're enlightened. You don't even need to think about being enlightened. You're just so free. Then some somebody will ask you like somebody who's way older than you or somebody or some just a miracle, where then somebody will ask you for advice or you'll. There'll be like a like your entire friend. Let's say you have a friend group, and they're all like depressed or just having a problem. You'll have the answer like nothing, and people will start or you or like people like things will happen. You'll be able to tell people exactly what's gonna happen, exactly the mistake they're gonna make, exactly the result of it. They won't listen to you, and then they'll come down. And it and it's crazy. In the east, I, it's like in the east they appreciate wisdom so much more. Like you see, it's almost sad, but it's like people kind of have their own version of that in the West, I guess, reactions to me when I kind of like predict their future. Like people get, you know, scared of cities. Like there's this, there's this joke that uh, the reason uh, saints rarely incarnate in the West is because they don't want to get crucified. And mm -hmm. it's like people get scared of like spiritual powers. And it, but it, the spiritual powers, think about it, the reason God gives sages spiritual powers is because skeptics, yo, man, you, you could save their lives. Like you could warn them and give them wisdom that like, damn, like, that ass predicted their future like and and they won't believe like they'll believe you but it's like they'll believe your words but until they see it happen that's the purpose of cities is like until they see it happen they don't really believe it so then it's like that's when you were able to predict their future like a couple times they're like oh my god like this what the hell are you what are you like they start mm -hmm. asking, like what are what how do you can you do this and then you tell them about the sages and then they realize holy shit wait a minute you're kind of the same as the guys you're telling me about. Like, 
like you and you don't even try like it's just this seems and it's like it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing like mm -hmm. so you you kind of uh talked about cities and spiritual powers right there uh for the people out there that don't know what those are how would you explain them how have you experienced them and how have you uh learned about them through your own uh path and through your own journey so I, the most the most credit I would give for my knowledge about cities would be Sage Siddhartha Meswar, because he he put imprinted in my mind and emphasized don't chase spiritual powers and like he says they'll be at your feet because God doesn't care about spiritual powers he's limitless he can have any power that he wants but so it's like it naturally comes to you and don't think that when you're in lane you'll just become this all powerful like saint that can like turn gold like a dirt into gold or something it's like if God it's God doing it through you. Like, for example, Sage Siddhartha Meshwar told this story. Uh, you guys can t probably tell I love Sage Siddhartha Meshwar right now. <laughs> but he told this story about how Lord Krishna was asked was asked by one of his devotees, Lord Krishna, how much power do you have? And he says, I don't know. I only know when my devotees need me. So God is only going to give you spiritual powers when needed, not when you want them. Because there is no you. It's just this animal that wants to capitalize on the power to use it for its own advantage. That's not you. The flow is you. So God will naturally use that power to help a devotee. For example, like one of my first devotees that I met in person, that I had in person, basically he was going through a situation with an, with an ex. Actually, no, I want to tell us, I'll tell a story about a, another devotee actually. So she was going through her, uh, a situation with um like her boyfriend, right? And before she even like, like, I had met him. I had met him one time. She wanted me to meet him, so I had met him, and just like the the, the source just uh, sent me everything I needed to know. I was like, yeah, he's an abuser. He's this and that. He who's gonna do this and this to you? Uh, if, I'm sure if you ask him about his exes, you'll find out this and that, and all this and that. Because my my devotees come to me to you know see through, you know people, and then it's like the more they come to me, the more they can do it themselves, awaken the inner guru, and the more the cities come to them. But in, in a sense that I was able to see through him to help her. But she, and what's beautiful is that she knew what, and this is what the difference between intellectual, people intellectually understand enlightenment, but it's different than direct experience. For example, she was able to understand that what I was saying was true. But because it's that mind that wants to see, it wants to go through the pain. It wants to wonder why I have to go through this pain. Oh, blah, blah, blah. The pain relief cycle, pain relief cycle, pain relief. After that, that whole thing happened. She didn't even really leave until the situation. She had to leave that situation. Everything I said happened and she, until she had to leave that situation. And she would just, sometimes we still laugh. Like, and this is why devotees love the sages so much. One of the reasons devotees love this, their gurus so much is because they never, they don't really listen to their gurus. But it's almost hilarious how much they're right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's, just, it's beautiful, like how cities are that's why you like neem Crowley bob like that's why a lot of his story beautiful stories have to do with cities because cities are made they're just pure love energy for the devotee it's really not for the the saint it's not for the saint it's for the a, a saint lives for his devotees it's not the other way around it's for both i mean it definitely is it goes both ways but in a sense that it's not like the other way around it's just that the it's for him it's for his devotees the power mm -hmm. that's a great way to put it uh i've made a video I uh, just recently on my Patreon talking about becoming a divine vessel for God. And when you get to those higher states of consciousness and you're detached and you're kind of flowing through life, all those different types of powers or cities or um, overall situations come into your life because you are now becoming not only serving yourself and serving your lower nature, but serving the greater will of everyone else around you because you're in that state of consciousness, understanding that one is all and all is one. And, all these different types of experiences will happen to you. And you might not realize like, man, like what is going on? Like, what is this like miracles happening to me when in reality it's because you're in that state of becoming a divine vessel for God that you experience it directly. And um, going off that topic, I want to talk about how you've become a divine vessel for God through YouTube and why you started your channel. What was the main message you want to preach and how was the process of going about giving out this type of information knowledge to people on social media. So one of my devotees had recommended that I had go, go on YouTube. And I was like, I mean, why not? Why not spread the freedom more? And obviously Madhu Sudana had done it. And I want to continue to spread the word. And 
you probably noticed I don't really talk about myself much. I try to talk about the sages as much as possible. So I want to use this vessel. Well, God is I. God, when you go when you go beyond the I, you realize the I is God too. So I basically want to use this vessel to spread true spirituality in the West and make them realize the importance of the sages and make them realize that being devoted to materialism leads you nowhere, literally. Because even if you're devoted to spirituality, it leads you nowhere. But the beauty of it is that you accept nowhere. And you, now you're not scared of that nothing that this ego is so scared of, that it's constantly seeking an identity, constantly seeking characteristics to add on to this limitless character that's beyond being a character. Mm -hmm. So basically, the reason I did my YouTube is, and, and I do these lectures on my YouTube and post them, is that it's just to spread freedom. And honestly, the grand reason that I do it is no, there is no reason, honestly. Like, I didn't expect any of this. I didn't, I never expected to be seen as a sage or a guru. I, I didn't, when I was younger, I did not know what this was. I'm only 19 years old. Like, playing the game of looking at myself through an outside perspective, I would, I would be like, what the fuck am I? Like, how is this 19 year old into this stuff? Like, what? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, but it, the goddess has her plans, and she's she she doesn't care about our logic. Our logic is boring. She does what she wants, and I, I let her do what she wants because she knows better than I. Because mm -hmm. there is no I. I don't like that I. Yeah, and how was like the process of like getting into YouTube? Like a lot of people would be like, "Oh man, I'm like kind of nervous of showing my face on camera, especially the type of stuff that you talk about, where it's like deeper concepts, and you might be looked at from your old friends or from your old neighborhood, like, yo, this guy's." frying out he's going crazy like now he's on youtube and talking about self-realization and all this stuff like how did you kind of overcome that through spiritual wisdom through the knowledge that you've attained to detach from all these external noises and stimulus and realizing that this is i'm being pulled in this direction for a reason i'm not choosing it it's literally pulling me i'm not pushing towards it but rather it's pulling me to it um and i'm, I'm glad he, this is a great question so the reason you have nervousness is because you're doing it for you. You're not doing mm -hmm. it selflessly. You're worried about, oh, what's gonna, what, what result am I gonna get? What reaction am I gonna get? Always thinking about this I. You're not doing it for the sages. And this is the problem with people in the West, is they're not doing it to spread the knowledge of wisdom, the knowledge of the sages. They're doing it to spread the knowledge of, oh, I'm a prophet, I figured this out. So let me be recognized for spreading this. But if you were truly selfless, because I was, people don't realize, before I even posted on YouTube, I was spreading Madhusudana's message. I was spreading the sage's message before I ever came on myself. And I only came on myself because somebody recommended I did. So I'm not doing it for me. That's why I'm not nervous. I don't care. I don't care. I, I don't care. Why would I care if Maya accepts me? What? That doesn't make any sense. Why do I care about Maya? Oh, this person in this town said something about, why is Maya? It's illusion. I, what is, that's ridiculous. You're God and you're worried about, like Sage Siddhar Meswar said, the sadhu is God. He doesn't care what human beings say. He's beyond all rules. And another beautiful thing, this is, it's free. This is, I mean, this is wisdom. You asked a great question. And this, say, say to the he has a great saying. He said, go, keep going. You'll see the spiritual, spiritual accomplishments are full of happiness. You'll see the blessings of the sadhguru and the pitiful condition of those who have been laughing at you. So when you're fearless and you trust the guru, you have no nervousness because you're like, those fools, they don't see, they don't see the, they're, they're, they're at below the mountain thinking they're at the top and you're at the top of the mountain and they, they think you're below. So it's hilarious. You almost laugh. You love fools who judge you. They actually add on to it. It's, it makes it funner because you realize like, you realize how sages, you look at other stories, how sages dealt with fools too. And you, and you're like, wow, this is just like an inevitable game. Like this beautiful cosmic joke, fools and wise men that, that, and wise women. That'll always be the cycle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about before how the East and the West is kind of that cosmic dance of like there's the fools in the West. There obviously are uh, wise people in the West, but it's more perpetuated the consumerism culture, the materialistic culture versus the East where a lot of this spirituality is deep rooted in their cultures. Would you say that somebody on this path should go and uh, search for knowledge in the Eastern scriptures, or can they find it anywhere and everywhere, regardless if it's in the West or not? Yeah, let me, so both in a sense, but, and let me explain what people in the West try to do. So they'll say, oh, 
You don't need scriptures. You don't need any knowledge to find the truth. Yes, the silence is the only thing that's going to lead you to the truth. Silence is the inner guru. But you also have knowledge that you're gaining that's helping you lead to that inner silence. And it's, all, it's about, and you, you, when you are aware of it, you use that to your advantage more. And the West has takes knowledge from the, the East and waters it down. And then they'll mm -hmm. say, oh, we don't need Eastern scriptures. But then they'll have somebody, but then that person who's saying there's no need for scriptures, his words will be the only scripture. That's how sneaky people are. They'll say, mm -hmm. oh, we don't need scripture, but his words will be the, then he'll, he'll be the only, okay, so, well, I'm not enlightened yet, so where do I learn? Well, well. Go inwardly. Go, but then they'll ask him, "How do I go inwardly?" Now he'll be the only scripture. But he was telling people, "No, oh, you're the only, you're the only source that will help you lead you to enlightenment." Obviously, you're the only source. There's only you. There's only God. So, but it's like people mistake. It's like the God Guru is God too. People helping you along the path to enlightenment are God too. The scriptures are mm -hmm. God too. So you can all the scriptures. If you really understand the scriptures, you understand they're actually a blank page. They might have words, but it's actually a blank page. But people say, you know, burn the scriptures and stuff like that. They're actually very helpful if you're not a fool. But if you want to be this prophet who has some parental issue where they want to just rebel for no reason instead of just using resources that are trying to help you, and then you wonder, oh, why am I not enlightened yet? Because you're not using the people who who perfected and have been kindling the eternal flame. Mm -hmm. Everybody has seen the eternal flame, but guess who has been kindling it? The East. You, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have known about this knowledge. The people went to the West and then they come to water it down. I, I'm like, you'll go in a yoga studio, an American yoga studio, and they won't even know, like, any, they won't even know where yoga was started. But what it means. The thing is stretching. What it, it means. just, yeah, they just look at it as stretching. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell? Yeah. Like, it's crazy. Like, what, are, what are some uh, texts or scriptures that, like a beginner or someone that's first getting on this path or maybe your younger self that you would recommend because now you've delved into so many different ones. What are the, some specific ones you would say like, okay, start off with these, then you'll get the gist of it or you'll get most of what we're trying to speak on, what we're trying to relay the message about and then get deeper into the more dense text. I would tell them to read I Am That by Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. But I would tell them don't read chapter by chapter. I would tell them to to read by what chapter speaks to your heart. Mm. Like don't say, oh, I'm gonna go read chapter one. Read chapter and maybe 99 if it just speaks to you because it's, they'll have different titles in the, in the chapter. And like for example, one of the I, one of the quotes I love that's a chapter is like whatever pleasures you keeps you back. And this and it's like you love the cycle of pleasure and pain. The more pleasure you have the pain comes, but then the relief of the pain makes you come back to, to wanting the pleasure. So in a sense that it keeps you in this loop, but when you read I Am That, it kind of gives you an introduction into going beyond consciousness in a sense mm -hmm. that it's better to know before you do, because Shazen Siddhartha also, he's very simple. Like he's very, his delivery is very simple. So for the beginner, it's very easy to understand and comprehend. Mm -hmm. And he won't fill your head with intellectual understanding. So it's good for the beginner to start off that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am that. What else would would it be on your list? I would a nice beginner. I would I would honestly I would say, I man, there's so many. I'd say the Ashtabhata Gita is good too. Mm -hmm. It's definitely it's definitely yeah. The Ashtabhata Gita is good because, but it's like everything for a beginner is like. Like, the thing is, a beginner, I can't even say, like, like the idea of a beginner, because I don't want even to think people, like, they're a beginner. Like, I get what you're yeah. saying, like, like, oh, begin, like, literally, physically, con like, they, in time, in the time, I get what you're saying, in the context of time, like, they are be literally a beginner, but, mm -hmm. I, like, don't think, I know, like, physic literally, physically, you are, but whoever's listening, don't think you're a beginner, think like you would naturally are a beginner. So don't think you are when you're reading this stuff. Cause then you'll like hold, you'll hold your intellect back. But like, and I know you weren't saying that to think of yourself, but you know, you get it. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I would recommend the Ashtabhata Gita and the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita mm -hmm. is amazing to read. And I, I mean, I could go on. I honestly, like, I, honestly, I was going to say maybe 
You know what? Remaster of self-realization by Sid Harmeshwar. Screw Advan- You- You know what? Make yourself advanced. Keep reading it over and over again. Remaster of self-realization by Sid Harmeshwar. That's- That's a little advanced, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. To jump right into the deep end. Yes. Master of mm -hmm. Self-Realization by Sri Siddhar Meshwar Maharaj. Mm -hmm. And, um, when you guys, when people are going throughout these books, would you say that each and every single uh, person will receive it differently? Like, as you stated before, each guru or different philosophy is preaching the same overall concept of truth, of universal truth, of self-realization, but just different avenues, different pathways or detours to get to the same mountain. So would you say that's the same concept within these books throughout each and everyone's different uh, perspectives? Yes, they may, they may eat a, one might eat a green apple, one might eat a, a red apple, but in the end, they'll both shit it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it'll be, it'll, you know, it's the end result is the end result. So it might taste different, it might be presented different, but the end result will be the same. Uh -huh. And how would you find your own personal um, kind of pull towards that certain packaging that really speaks to you? Like for you, it's definitely in that Vedic and more Hindu uh, philosophy. For some people, it might be in the more Taoist, Taoist philosophy. Some For some people, it might be in a completely different other realm. But they're all going to, again, lead to that same path. How would you kind of... Uh, give advice to someone to find their own little style or their sauce that they really enjoy. Yes. So follow your heart because I'm telling you, the more you follow your heart, let God do her thing because Sage Varupa, there's a story of Sage Varupa. And that I, this is why I call it the Buddhist disease is people get caught up in a set way. Of, oh, if I behave this way, this means I'm enlightened. If I do this and that, if I'm a vegetarian, this means I'm enlightened. But there was a sage named Varupa who, in his monastery, he used to eat meat and drink alcohol. And some people are like, what the hell? How's an enlightened being drinking meat and eating alcohol? People don't realize that because you're beyond... The, what does alcohol affect and meat have to do with? Being beyond... Be, no. What does meat and alcohol have to, have to do with? The body and the mind. But you are beyond the body and the mind. So even if you drink alcohol and eat meat, you are beyond both. Mm -hmm. So people get caught up in like, oh, if I behave this in that way, this means I'm enlightened. But in order to, to really have your own swag, have your own style and have your own way, you have to kill the master in a sense that you have to realize that, okay, the master helped me get to this point. But what's all, only, the only thing that's going to lead me all the way is the inner guru. Because mm -hmm. you have to realize that only no true guru is going to tell you that, oh, if you behave this way, this means you're enlightened. The guru is going to tell you that the inner silence is your enlightenment, not, oh, what ha happens around the silence. It's what comes out of the silence that is not you, but you are also a part of, it is also a part of you, but it's not who you mm -hmm. are all the time. So in a sense that even though you can do whatever you want, you are also realize that when you're blissful, you don't have no need to commit um, immoral actions because you're satisfied within yourself. So you have no problems, you have no issues. But in a sense that don't think morality is also your idea of morality, your idea of a way is enlightenment. So that's how you find your own way, by being beyond the need for a way. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect way to say it. Like you can't have the, your own preconceptions and your own prejudgments kind of like map out your own way to enlightenment. Like it's already preordained or pre-set by fate. And that kind of brings me to another topic that a lot of people wrestle with when it comes to getting into spirituality is fate versus free will. Like, how would you explain that? And what are your own uh, ideas and philosophies behind it? So I just chose to pick up this lighter to use it as an example, right? Mm -hmm. Why did I choose the lighter though? You, some might say, oh, it was closest to me. No, it wasn't. The scissors was closer to me. So why did I choose the lighter? Some people might say, well, it was just in your view. It was the closest to your view. No, it wasn't. This this Starburst wrapper was the closest to my view. Mm. So why did I choose the lighter? It was God. You see, you have choices in the moment, but before you even had the idea of a choice, your mother had complete control over you. Mm -hmm. And then you grew up, and then you started formulating ideas, right? You started taking things from existence, reacting to it, and this idea of you form where you had morals, but if you grew up in a cannibal tribe, eating human beings would be completely normal to you. But then you'd be shamed for being a cannibal. And, but in a sense that 
you had to, was it your choice to become a cannibal? No, mm-hmm. it wasn't. It just happened. But because we're scared of being nothing, we don't realize that nothing we do is really us. Because everything has something to do with everything. Everybody affects everybody. So how can you have free will? You have the idea of free will. You have moments of free will. But in the absolute, it's all preordained. Mm -hmm. You can only have moments of free will. You can only have ideas of free will. Because ask the slaves in the 1700s if they had free will. If they they wanted to be in that situation. If they felt like they had free will. If, If, oh, well, they had the choice to escape. Like, what kind of choice is that? That's what they, exactly what they would say to you. So, free will is a joke. You don't do what you want to do. You do what existence wants you to do. You don't, you're not even a you. You just happen, mm-hmm. if you were switched at birth, you wouldn't even be calling your parents your parents, but you say you have free will. And, you, and But everything is, you go out in the sea and you, and you capsize. And see how, go out in the ocean and see how much free will you have. And see how much mm-hmm. everything pulls you, to, kind of directs you. Because when somebody's swimming, they, they go with the ocean. okay. That is that way. The island is that way. So I have to swim this way. You see, everything is is based on something. Like the island had to be there for me to make a decision to swim. Let's say I was stranded. Got, I had I had to. Be, I was in stranded in the ocean. The island's that way. So I have to swim to the right. Now I made the choice to swim to the right, but I was on the deserted. The island was already there, so I had to swim there. Now I create a character that says I'm a person who made the choice to swim to the right, but that piece of earth was already there. Mm-hmm. So it chose before me before I even before I even got there. Mm-hmm. And for the people that are like getting that information and knowledge of a free will, they might be thinking like, "Oh man, that sucks! Like I already have everything in my life planned out. Like it's just fate. Like I don't have any choice or are any choice in the totality of things. Just have choices in the moment, like you said." But how would you say to them that this is one of the most like? Bring or blissful things that you can actually uh, ingrain into your unconsciousness to be able to help free you and enlighten you and get you to those higher states of consciousness. You bring it into your life by not trying to bring it into your life. You just do. Mm-hmm. You just are. Mm-hmm. You don't try to be in the flow. You don't even try to think about the flow. You just let it be and trust existence. You have to be willing to die at all times. You have to be willing to jump off the cliff and then be caught in, your, in the hands by God. But you have to trust that the hands will be there. And, if, and you'll realize that people will think, I will always have to rely on having that faith. But actually, you'll develop wings when you do that. Instead of God's hands catching you, he'll actually just drop wings on you. Mm. It's actually funny. It's a great analogy right there. It'll give you wings instead of always catching you. Like a lot of people are always anxious about the future, always depressed about the past. When they free themselves from that, they develop those wings, like you said before, where you kind of are in control, but you're not trying to be in control anymore. Like you finally settle into the flow, like with the current of the ocean, that it's going to pull you this way regardless. Like you're either going to try fighting it by... Uh, being worried about the past or you're gonna try fighting it by being worried about the future when in reality if you just kind of flow with the current of the ocean it'll take you exactly where you're always going to go regardless if you're going to fight or not but now in a more pleasurable and um overall blissful way instead of like trying to fight things now you're just flowing with it yes exactly that that, that river's a great analogy too because it's like somebody you think you're like for when you get control of like a like you're just floating in the river you're controlling your body, but you think, oh, I'm in control of the river. Mm-hmm. And the river is kind enough to have variables that make it possible for you to do that. So it's a unison. It's not you controlling the river. It's not the river controlling. You. I mean, it kind of, it really is, but you can control yourself in the river. But the river is God controlling you and you can kind of move along in the river. But then you also, you become the river after mm-hmm. you become God. Mm-hmm. And so then you think you have control. Yeah, go 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 for it. You think you have control, but the river is really leading you. But so, sorry, you're saying. Yeah, I was gonna say before we wrap things up, I was gonna ask you like, for anyone out there who is kind of getting introduced into your channel and stuff like that, what is the main message that you want people to get when they click on your videos, when they click on your channel, they go on to 
all the uh, content that you have, what is the main uh, thing that you really want them to take away? If there's like one thing that they can really grasp from the video. The mind can never make you suffer. You can only think it does. You can only think you're suffering. You can never suffer. Try to suffer without thinking about it and see how much you really you suffer. Mm -hmm. That's why animals are, you'll see a dog, his, his jaw is hanging out or a lion jaw hanging out and they're just walking. It's not that they're not feeling pain. They're not thinking, oh, I'm a person who's feeling pain. Now I know an idiot will say, animals feel pain. What are you talking about? I didn't say they didn't feel pain. I said they don't create an identity out of the pain. They just are go purely going through pain. So mm -hmm. don't create, oh, I'm somebody who suffers. Pay attention to the I am and don't put anything after the I am and see what happens. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. to stay in the pure being, the I am, your pure existence. So just see what happens. Mm -hmm. That just relates like every experience in life. Like don't, even if it's good, if it's bad, if it's uh, happy, if it's sad, like don't attach yourself to that because it's temporary. It's just going to, be there for a little bit and then pass on. But if you attach to it, then you kind of equate your uh, potential to that experience. Like you said before, you're going from limited to limitless. I'm pretty sure that's probably should be your slogan or something that you put onto uh, all your content, going from limit li limited to limitless. But uh, to wrap things up, uh, what, what people can go find you? What more things that you have cooking up? What are projects you have uh, coming out in the next... Uh, couple months weeks down the line what are some things that you really want to expand on when it comes to your overall message your brand and the overall um social media presence that you're building so i'm, I'm gonna be even i'm gonna be talking about the sages even more i'm up in the i bought a bunch of books like i bought six sacred texts a bunch of books and i've already read them online but i want to have them in person in the, in the book and talking of taking from the book and, and talking about the quote and explaining it. Because Sage Siddhar Meshwar, he used to, his lineage basically, they read the Das, das Bode and the, um, I, f I forgot what the other, it's, it's I forgot what the other book is called. I don't want to just guess. And I, oh, I, I'm like, I just give some fake name, act like I have the best memory ever. Mm -hmm. But it, it is, it's like one book that he reads, every, he read every day for his lineage. And basically I want to do the same. And it's like, you see, and another thing too, don't be afraid to like, like, we all get inspiration from somewhere, so don't be afraid to get inspired by somebody. And, like, I'm giving credit right now. Like I got inspired by him to do that. So, and Mata Sudana also did that with the Dao De Chang. And I'm sure Mata Sudana gets inspired by this. And Sage Siddhar Mesra always talks about how he got inspired by his guru. So, don't be ashamed of being inspired by the sages. But um, I will be definitely talking about the sages a lot. Like, a lot in, with books and stuff like that. And just a lot more. I, honestly, like, basically the same i don't really plan like what i do i just i just kind of i just like yeah i let Kali do her thing with me like uh, yeah just flow just flow yeah literally like i'm not my patreon people are probably gonna be like oh my god where's my money going but i, I don't have I, like, like i don't have a next patreon video planned or something but it's okay don't worry guys It'll, the mother will will take care of that I'm, I'm a lazy man but the mother makes me work don't worry there you go <laughs> and uh so people can find you on youtube uh let them know. I'll put everything in the description down below, but also, so YouTube, uh, Patreon, Instagram, where, where is the tags that people can find you at? So if you just search up Guruji, Josiah, or Brahmin, I'll come up on everywhere. So that's YouTube, Patreon, uh, Instagram, anything else? Yeah, just, yeah, just Guruji, Josiah, yeah, is, is the, is the, uh, or if, yeah, if, you, if it's easier, you can search up Guruji, Brahmin, every, I'll, I'll definitely come up on, on all those. Sounds good. Sounds good, man. Well, I appreciate you joining the podcast, man. That was Thank an you, enlightening brother. discussion. That was, we covered a lot of different topics. We probably could have gone even longer than this because there's so much stuff we can unpack and learn and just kind of share back and forth with this uh, overall philosophies that we're really diving into. So maybe we'll do this another time. Maybe we'll get onto uh, the Guruji uh, Brahmin podcast later on down the line. But I appreciate you joining hey. on, man. That was great. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with uh, another saint. As Sage Siddhar Meshwar said, actually, I want to use this Bodhi Rama quote. He said, to be with wise men is to be amongst kinfolk. So I'm grateful to be with you. It's great. It's, a saint is one who's devoted to wisdom, and it's, it's, it's amazing to be with somebody else who's devoted to wisdom. Likewise, man. Likewise. So appreciate you joining on, man. And I'll see you next time. Peace.